All right, all right, all right. Okay, we're going to keep everything going on. The education's going on right here, right now. How many of you love beautiful eye candy and landscape photography? Beautiful pictures with beautiful colors and beautiful activity throughout the frame. I know, Al, you love that kind of stuff, right? Mike Mezuel II is one of the premier landscape photographers in the country, probably in the world right now. He spent a lot of time in Hawaii recently. He's going to show you his incredible landscape photographers. Let me introduce the Nikon Theater stage, Mike Mezuel II. Cool. Well, I appreciate it, brother. All right, ready? Ready? Boom. 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 Bam. <laughs> hey, guys. How you guys doing? Yeah, we're going to start the wave, left to right. No? Nobody's doing a wave? All right. Uh, first off, guys, I'd like to uh, thank Nikon for having me alongside so many incredibly talented. Can you guys hear me now? Better? Whoa. How about now? We good? No? Good? OK. All right. So I'd like to thank Nikon for having me alongside so many incredibly uh, talented photographers and ambassadors. Those guys do nothing but continue to inspire and to push the envelope with photography. Also, before we get going, I'd like to thank three members of the United States National Guard, uh, Major Duff Hickman, Sergeant Chang, and uh, Sergeant Jackson. Without those guys, uh, their, their escorts into Leilani Estates, this project wouldn't be possible. So a little bit about myself. I've had a fascination with severe weather, in particular tornadoes, and that's what I've done most of my career with, uh, photography-wise. But I always, always had a little hidden fascination for volcanoes. And, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily the safest subject, but I wanted to get out there to photograph them. So in 2016, I got my first opportunity to go to an active volcano, and that was the Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. Now, I went out there, photographed the 61G lava flow. It was nice, it was calm, it was in Volcanoes National Park, so it was rather easy to go to. And when I saw the lava for the first time, I was hooked. I knew I'd be back on a volcano shortly, but not how quickly uh, as, as happened. Two years later, May of this year, a series of events took place on the island of Hawaii, which led to one of the biggest eruptions of the Kilauea volcano in 500 years. Now, when I heard about this, I immediately was like, all right, I'm going back to Hawaii. My schedule begged to differ, though. I had to wait three weeks. Three weeks later, I found myself on a plane out to Hawaii, and I was thinking about what I was going to cover out there. And I decided that I wanted to cover the effects of the volcano on the residents of Leilani Estates. But when I got out there, my first five days, I encountered a total of four residents. It's like the Hawaiians had been through this before, and they knew to get the heck out of Dodge. So instead of being greeted with uh, fleeing residents and that story, I was greeted with essentially a ghost town. And there were abandoned homes everywhere, abandoned cars, streets that looked like they had been through hell. This street in particular was quite interesting because as you can see, it's full of these cracks. These cracks are now maybe two inches wide to six feet wide, 30 feet deep, and large enough to swallow up a car. In fact, some of the cracks actually turned into their own fissures and had lava erupt erupting out of them at one point. Now, it was interesting, we went out there a couple times, sometimes hours apart, and you could see the effects of the magma, how it was moving beneath the street. These cracks would open, they would close, and like I said, uh, they would have volcano or lava coming out of them, uh, as in this street right here. All that lava wasn't there the day before, and then when we came back, an eruption had taken place. One of the nights, like I said, it was a ghost town out there, we stopped at this playground. And this playground, it had this eerie feel to it. You couldn't quite comprehend what was going on. You're here at a playground where memories were once made, children, children played, their families laughed, and now you're sitting there listening to fissures erupt, and you're looking at, if you look on the bottom of the frame here, those are all lava bombs. Those are pieces of lava that had been ejected out of the fissures and landed in this park. So it was really weird to sit there and wonder if these families would ever be able to return back here and make those memories again. Now, the 61G lava flow back in 2016 was easy to document. I could walk right up to it. The lava was moving at a snail's pace. This event was much different. We had, first off, visual obstacles, homes, dense forests, 
uh, private property that we couldn't go onto. So getting good, clean views of the lava was quite rare. Now, when I did see it, I could tell you that it was absolutely beautifully terrifying. Much different event. This lava was racing towards us. It was destroying everything and anything that was right in front of its path. So seeing it just take out mailboxes, power lines, homes, cars, this was the time that I, I really saw and felt the power of the volcano. Now, not everything was pure chaos. This shot right here, this lava is crawling down and uh, going maybe a mile an hour, two miles an hour. So I was able to go up there with my tripod, set up my D850, 14 to 24, take a nice long exposure, and do this all safely. What intrigued me about this moment right here was you could see the lava advancing towards me, but behind here, essentially the, the, whole, t the whole frame back there is a river of lava. And this image looks like it was taken at sunset. This is actually 11 p.m. at night. That lava, the way it reflected off the clouds was absolutely beautiful. But once again, this whole event was hard to kind of comprehend beauty versus disaster because you can see on the left-hand side, power lines were falling left and right as this advanced um, and was continuing to destroy the area of Leilani Estates. Now, on May 29th, uh, that evening, everything changed. Fissure 8 erupted from fountaining lava maybe 50 feet in the air to over 300 feet in the air and producing 28,000 gallons of lava per second. This shot was taken three quarters of a mile away with a 500 millimeter lens. And I remember taking this and it sounded like a jet was taking off right next to me. That's how loud it was. And it was on this night that I kind of took, took in and I was like, hey, I don't think my access to getting close to lava is going to happen anymore. This has taken a really dangerous path. And in fact, uh, one of the nights we were actually thrown in the back of a pickup truck and evacuated out of there because one of the lava dams, in which you'll see here in a second, broke. So things are getting a little crazy. But once again, there's a beauty to it. So this is a shot looking straight up 14 millimeters at the sky, 11 PM at night. And it looks like the sky is just absolutely on fire. And I love the way that the tree branches kind of looked like veins, you know, kind of veins of an eye kind of flowing through the sky there. Uh, so kind of a nice abstract shot to be seen in all the chaos. I mentioned earlier that Fisher 8 was going crazy. There were also other hazards that were starting to happen and take place. This is a 90-foot tall wall of lava. And uh, it was not safe to get near. Reason being is if you look at the top part of it, what do you guys see? It's starting to breach. One night, one of these broke. Two, uh, sorry, AD7 homes were taken out in a matter of two hours. Uh, this lava at times was moving close to 60 miles an hour. That right there is Sergeant Chang for scale. Another thing that happened with the copious amounts of lava that were being produced, lava has heat. Heat creates heat waves. So the visibility of the fissures was starting to become obscured by the uh, heat waves. So a lot of the shots started looking the same. You couldn't see any detail, any chunks of lava flying, nothing like that. It was essentially a flame behind a 30% Gaussian blur, let's call it. Our trade winds started to die down. Our trade winds were important because they blew all that sulfuric dioxide gas away, or at least stirred it and mixed it out in the atmosphere a little bit. Without the trade winds, they pulled up. And we turned the corner one day, and our SO2 monitors on, our, on, our, uh, on the National Guardsmen started going crazy. We immediately had to put gas mask on, turn the vehicle around, and haul out of there. Now, sulfur dioxide, I don't know if anybody's got a whiff of it, it's nasty stuff. You get a small whiff of it, it'll irritate your chest. If you get into a really dense area of it, parts per million-wise, it could kill you. So we saw this and uh, got the heck out of Dodge. And it's if there weren't enough hazards. Uh, the volcano was erupting quite, uh, quite a lot of uh, lava high into the air. So what happened is we had what's called tephra falling from the air. Tephra is volcanic rock. You don't have to worry about that. You know, it's falling from the air, but it weighs less than a feather. What you have to worry about is what's in the tephra, and that's called Pele's hair. Pele's hair is a volcanic glass. It's abrasive. If you turn it on or turn on your windshield wipers, 
and uh, it's on your windshield, it will cut into that glass. Now that's scary enough, but what's even more scary is if you get it wet. So you get it in your nose, in your eyes, in your throat, it turns to an acid. And I un unfortunately experienced uh, vision loss in my right eye one night when I got it in my eye. Uh, so lots of hazards, lots of things changing, but I still wanted that beauty shot of the Fisher. So what I did is uh, I said goodbye to the military and I found my way in with a resident. And that resident happened to own a home that was right nearby Fisher 8. And I was able to grab this shot, a nice clear shot. The winds worked out well. We were on the other side of the law of a river, so you didn't have that heat distortion. No idea what that guy in the bottom right hand side of the frame is doing. This was shot with a 200 millimeter lens. So I uh, kept him in there for scale, but I don't know if he's ever heard of a zoom lens himself. Hope he's OK. Um, one heck of a view, though. Another moment on that street, this was kind of what reminded me of like, being in a Hollywood movie. It just didn't seem real. This is looking down the road, uh, mailbox after mailbox, home after home, abandoned cars, and then a giant volcano. Uh, this was just completely weird to me to see what was once a neighborhood being torn to shreds. One final look in the rear of your mirror uh, at Fisher 8. This is the last time I was in Leilani Estates. Now, with that amount of lava that had been produced, now this wasn't the only fissure. There were 24 separate fissures in this event. A lot of lava, enough lava to cover 13.7 square miles of land and create 875 acres of new land in the ocean. So with that said, this lava went to the ocean, so I decided to go to the ocean as well. Tried to cover this event from many different angles. Now, I covered the ocean entry from sunrise, sunset, all these different times of day, but my favorite time of day was being out there uh, prior to sunrise. You could see the lava kind of illuminating the uh, steam cloud from the inside there, kind of like a nice little nightlight. And on the left-hand side here, that guy, that little glow, that's Fisher 8, nine miles away. So if that gives you any idea how big that Fisher was, uh, it was just insane. Getting a little light on sunri uh, from sunrise. Steam cloud has a lot of detail to it. Became really, really beautiful to shoot. Bottom left-hand side, you can start seeing a little bit of an explosion there. All the lava rivers uh, become visible. As beautiful as that was, I did fall in love with shooting the steam cloud itself. It looked like uh, just staring at a, one of those train locomotive engines, you know, the steam ones, just how violently it was erupting into the air. And this would go a couple miles into the air and have this dark gray look to it. So putting that on one side of the frame with my 14 millimeter and a sunrise on the other, it was just a really nice contrast. Now, most of what I shot on the ocean entry was 14 to 24 or 24 to 70 millimeters. But I did have my 70 to 200 with me for moments like this. When you had the correct winds, you would be able to see the rivers of lava pouring into the ocean. This was shot before sunrise. And uh, I just love the way that the orange and the red glow of the lava reflected off the clouds and the water there. Just gave a really nice scene. Now, these rivers were all packed together in the hundreds. But if you move further south into the ocean entry, you would find areas of lava that were kind of just uh, dying out. So you'd have one, one drip of lava here, one drip of lava here. And I love shooting that area because you could have pure isolation like this shot right here. The color contrast, the, the reds, the oranges against the cooling black lava, and the steam just gave a really nice uh, environment to the scene right here. Does anybody else see uh, Gene Simmons' tongue here? Now, if anybody says shooting from the ocean is completely safe, they're lying. There were hazards, just like there were on land. Those hazards were these guys. They're called littoral explosions. Now, lava enters the ocean not only from the, uh, the shoreline, but also from underneath the crust. And when it does that, it's got nowhere to go but up. And then it explodes out the top of the water and goes 100, 200 feet into the air and launches lava bombs everywhere. Uh, I don't know if anybody heard about the, uh, the boat that got hit by the lava out there. This was the same boat just a week prior. The thing that made these so scary is there is absolutely no way to predict where they're going to come up. So all you hear is what sounds like a depth charge going off. And then about two seconds later, 
anywhere around you, it could erupt. So you kind of clinch up when you hear that sound. And then uh, when you realize it's not under the boat, uh, you take the photo. This is with the 70 to 200. And it was such a great uh, part of the event to cover because it's such a peculiar part as well. And I just love all the detail of seeing the uh, small chunks of lava. And when I say small, that one's probably beach ball size. That one up there is probably about three, four feet wide. Uh, so just a really great uh, moment to capture out on the ocean. And like I said, a way different part of the event that most people didn't see. Now having enough uh, seasickness for a little while, I decided to try and go and find different vantage points for, this, uh, for the event. This is in the town of Hilo. This is a 70 millimeter shot. Uh, this is at night. This is 26 miles away from the eruption. So 26 miles away, you could clearly make out what's going on. Far right hand side, that's Fisher 8. The whole sky in between is illuminated by the lava river. And then this guy right here, that's the ocean entry. So it was quite amazing to be 26 miles away and still see the event and get an idea for just how large it was. So that sparked my curiosity. If I can see for 26 miles away, just how far can you travel and still see the event? This is the top of the 14,000 foot dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. This is taken at night, so those are the stars shining above. Left hand side is the glow from Hilo. Right hand side, you'll see that the clouds transition from a nice white to a vibrant orange. That is indeed the glow of the whole eruption going through the clouds and illuminating from bottom to top. Now, I was blown away by this image right here, but I was also intrigued because I noticed that the cloud deck was quite thin. So I wondered, hey, is there a sweet spot anywhere that I could go to where I can see the lava, the clouds, and the stars above? So I made my way down the mountain a little bit, and that sweet spot was 4,000 feet below right here. Found an opening in the brush, and sure enough, stars above, the clouds, and right here, the ocean entry, the lava wrapping around Green Mountain, and then all the way on the Lava River to Fisher 8. So that right there was absolutely amazing to see, but also kept my curiosity. All right, if this is how big it looks from 50 miles away, there's only one other way to document this to get a real feel for, for the eruption, and that was by air. Now, I did a charter, uh, six charters, in fact, on a helicopter. And seeing this event from the air, air really gave me uh, that wow moment of this is huge. Now, the FAA, FAA had put in what's called a TFR, temporary flight restriction. So we couldn't fly any lower than 3,000 feet. So most of these images you're going to see here were shot with a Nikon 200 to 400 millimeter lens. Not just because we were high up in the air, but I also wanted to focus on the detail of the event. This is looking straight down into Fisher 8 as we hovered above. And trust me, yes, 3,000 feet up above a volcano, it is still extremely hot. It was very bouncy due to the thermals. But looking straight down, this is about 250 millimeters. It was absolutely mesmerizing seeing the lava boil and churn beneath. It was like staring into a, a boiling water pot, but lava shooting 300 feet into the air and like I said, 28,000 gallons of lava per second. That's enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool every second. Now, although I wanted to focus on the details and the beauty of the event, I felt it was necessary to shoot some of the shots showing the destruction as well. On the right-hand side here, you could see Leilani Estates, the houses that still stand. Left-hand side, that's Fisher 8. That is a quarter mile wide channel of lava. And unfortunately, it's seen, we saw it way too often. Remember that lava levy I talked about earlier, breaching? Well, this is one of them breaching right there and a fresh flow of lava about to take out some homes. It was very conflicting from there. Beautiful, the lava, the, the contrast, the detail, the texture, all that in the top two thirds of the frame. Then down below, you see the reality of it taking out people's property and homes. Over 800 homes were lost. 2,000 people had to evacuate. But thankfully, nobody perished in this event. Another one of those moments of I don't know what to feel. The science part of you, the nerdy part of you is like, wow, that is uh, Mother Nature and Earth doing her thing. You know, you got a, a Fisher number 22 flowing lava out. 
Left-hand side, you can see an island of the road. And you wonder you know, how this road uh, worked, how people's lives were affected by it, and you know, it'll never be traveled again. Something else I fell in love with in the air was the uh, lava river itself. It was so cool to see flight to flight how it changed. It diverged, it converged, it grew, it shrunk, what it went around and what it took. For instance, this moment right here, looking straight down, this is another uh, moment that left me kind of going, wow. You look down, you have this giant flow of lava, and then all of a sudden it comes up to this set of trees and just splits around it and then reconnects and continues on its way. Those, uh, those moments were uh, few and far to see you know, lava is kind of sparing something out there. Another moment, not a, not a uh, you know, terrific shot, but it's a shot looking down, and there's a lot more science to it than I thought. Looking down here, what do you guys notice about the right-hand side of the frame? It's green. What do you guys know about the left-hand side? Everything's dead. So this image right here shows you how important the winds were in this event and what lived and what died. So this area received a lot of the trade winds. So all that sulfuric dioxide glass, uh, gas blew off to the left, suffocated all the vegetation, killed it off. On the right-hand side, there were farmers still farming this land as we flew over. Moving down to the ocean entry, uh, it was so challenging to shoot here, but so rewarding. You had a ginormous uh, cloud of steam that essentially blocked your view of all the lava. But if you hovered long enough, you'd catch a few glimpses of the red lava, the black cooled lava against the white contrast of the steam. And it made for a really beautiful scene. This shot right here is at 400 millimeters, looking pretty much straight down. When, when we saw the hole in the steam coming, had the helicopter uh, pilot kind of knock the helicopter to the side, get the skid out of the way, and we were able to shoot straight down here. Some days you got really, really good uh, opportunities with the wind. This moment right here, all the wind was blowing is pretty much parallel to the uh, lava rivers. And you can look straight down and you could see hundreds of these fingers of lava feeding into the ocean. And once again, the contrast here, the detail, all of that uh, was one of the reasons why I fell in love with shooting the ocean entry from the air. Another detail shot, I wanted a nice tight shot showing the contrast of the lava river against the crust. And this was an area that I didn't want to crop this shot. I wanted to get it right in camera. So I was zoomed in to 400 millimeters, and we sat, and we hovered for about five or six minutes over this area. And then we had the winds break for a second. The steam moved over, and we had a clean shot looking straight down. Now, being up in the air, there's a lot of moments that made you go, huh. And this was one of them. So this right here was floating down a river of lava. I wondered what in the heck it was, so we kind of paralleled it for a little bit. I rattled off a few frames. And then it moved into this area where the lava was cooling and crusting. And this is the shot you see here. I just love the way the texture is, all the lines, the cracks, the detail. But more importantly, I loved what was on this. And that's actually called a lava berg. Didn't know there was such a thing, but it's called a lava berg, and it's about the size of a school bus. And if you look closely, you could see all the lava had cooled and crusted, and you have all that ropey texture, and it's floating in the middle of this river right here. So that was just really intriguing. Uh, you didn't see that quite often. And once again, this is a 400 millimeter shot looking straight down. One last shot here for you guys. Um, I know it's not the most fascinating and most mind-blowing uh, image, but it's an important one. You know, talking to a lot of the residents of the Pune area that experienced the eruption, they were upset that they had lost their property or their homes, but they were understanding and accepting of it because it's part of Hawaii. So if these eruptions didn't exist, the Hawaiian Islands wouldn't exist. Now that the event has uh, calmed down, the event actually ended in early August, and the residents are being allowed to return now to their homes. This is one of the newest black sand beaches in the world and one of the newest tidal pools. And these residents are now going down to the coastline to enjoy their new beaches. So thank you guys very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the images. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Mesuel II.
We've got one more amazing program coming up that you do not want to miss. Her name is Deanne Fitzmorris. She's going to talk to you about a film she made called Band on the Run with the Nikon Z7. 4.30 right here at the Nikon Theater stage. Deanne Fitzmorris, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and co-founder of Think Tank Bags right here in the booth. 4.30 at the Nikon Theater. <laughs>